Good morning, church. I want to welcome you to Leather Baptist Church this morning. We're so glad, so honored you have chosen to be with us today. I just want to remind you about a few things. Uh, one is Wednesday night. We have our family night. It's a great time. We have something for the nursery, for our preschoolers, for our children, our preteens, our youth, college students, adults. We have something for everybody. It's a great time. So I want to encourage you to be here on Wednesday night at 6 30 for a Wednesday night family night. Also, Sunday mornings. At 9 o'clock, we have our small groups. Once again, classes for everybody. I'm studying a bunch of different topics. So come in. If you're not a part of a small group, see someone. See one of the teachers, one of the staff here. We would love to get you involved in one of our small groups. You may have noticed that beside me and over here in the building, the children's building is going up. As the children and preschool are getting their own little area to be. It's not a little area. It's a big area to be together. That's an awesome way to start a service, amen. Will, please stand. So glad to see you here at Leatherwood. So glad to see you here. That's the worst of this morning. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. By God's word, at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. There your mercy and your grace was free. There your pardon multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given Jesus everything. Your mercy and your grace was free. 
Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise his name. Continue to worship with us this morning. Goodness of God.
Amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise you. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you and I praise you for just allowing us to stand and worship you this morning. You're so worthy to be praised, Lord. I just was so excited to be able to be in your presence with other believers worshiping you. Lord, I just pray right now, Lord, for those that are here this morning, Lord, within the sound of my voice or those that are listening home, that they're unsure of their salvation or they know, they know that they're lost. Lord, I pray, Lord, that today be the day. Lord, something said, something sung, Lord, something just pricks their heart, Lord. And I pray that today be the day they just can't stand it. They can't wait any longer. They got to come running, fall at your feet, Lord. Lord, I just thank you that you just afford us that opportunity, Lord, to just come to you. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We praise you for all you do. Thank you for your love your grace and your mercy you pour out, out on us each and every day. These things I ask in your most precious and holy name. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank you very much, Shane, Kelly Lynn, the praise team. Y'all did an awesome job leading us in worship today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. As we celebrate this time of year where our kids are going back to school, and yes, parents, we do celebrate that. That's that holiday that's not on the calendar, but we do celebrate it. The topic of today's message is going to be when ministry is a top priority, we better prevent spiritual weakening. I want to tell you a story about when I was 16 years old. I started attending a local church just down the road. And many of you know that church very well. But at the end of the service, someone would always come up and pray to dismiss us, much like we do here. And I'd been going for a few weeks, and I had kind of realized that this is how it goes, and that the closing prayer is just kind of a formality to, to get us out of the building. Well, then this man came up to pray that I had never seen before. He wasn't dressed like the rest of the guys. He wasn't dressed like I am today. He was wearing blue jeans, work boots, and a, and a, and a working shirt. And he got up there, and he prayed something that I still remember twice my life down there. Half my life ago, this prayer that he prayed, his name was Philip. And Philip was a working class man from Welburn, Alabama. And this prayer that he prayed grabbed me that long ago, and I still pray something like it today. He said in his closing prayer, he said, Lord, let us go forth with our witness and reach somebody with the gospel before it is everlasting too late. And I respect Philip because he lives that life every single day. As we get ready to go back to school, parents, I know this is an important time for you like it's an important time for your child. But in the way the world is today, I want to give you one charge, and that's this. To train your children in the Lord at home and to always be involved at what happens at school. Now, you also need to give grace to everybody that you can. You should love and respect teachers and administration but there is no substitute for a present parent to keep your child going the way that the Lord wants them to go. If you would stand this morning as we read 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 12. As you're turning there again, Paul, he's in prison, not once, but a second time in Rome. He's pretty, he's pretty familiar with the jail cell. He's pretty familiar with house arrest. He knows how it works. But this time Paul's discerning that this is likely going to be his last time in jail. He's probably not going to get to leave alive. So these are the words that he writes to dear Timothy. Verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also all those who have loved his appearing. Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas in love with his present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark. Get John Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for this ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we want to say the same thing you said, but in a prayer, Lord. We want it to be a prayer to you this morning that we can say of you that we love you and that, that we want to be poured out as a drink offering Lord, we want to say that we fought the fight, that we have kept the faith, that we have run the race in such a way that brings you honor and glory. Now, Lord, help us to do that. As parents of children, help us to be that example to them because the world doesn't give them much to look at. But, Lord, we can and our church can. So strengthen us for the mission that this next semester is going to bring. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you can be seated. Hopefully all the demons are exercised out of our sound system. If not, get ready for another blast, one or two, because I just started the sermon. 
when ministry is a top priority, we serve those that we love and those that God loves. There's a lot new about this season in life. But new seasons bring familiar challenges. And some of those challenges Paul knew that Timothy had would be the same ones that you and I would face this day. And the, the one that I see that is so glaringly obvious is the possibility of weakening spiritually. There's not a person in this room who will say that they have always felt just this close to the Lord. We know that the life of a Christian is ebb and flows, close and far, near and far, ups and downs. And the possibility of weakening spiritually is out there all the time. You know, I've, I've realized that many of us are, are really in tune with our bodies. And, and, and when they start to get weak, we know it. Even as kids, if, if something was ailing us, we would run to our moms or to our dads and say, hey, hey, I'm not feeling well. And, and we would get them to do something for us. And as we get older, if it's a, a, an eye that waters, nose drip, head hurts, muscle aches, etc., we jump into some mode to fix it. I get ear infections about every other month, and I just know that the moment I feel that ear starting to go, I go to the urgent care, I give them my money, and I say, give me a steroid shot. And, and they'll start doing all the other checks. Well, let me check. I said, listen, let's save some time. I need a steroid shot. Okay, just take a peek in this ear. It's pink and red and it hurts. So please give me a shot. And somebody shoot that sound system while you're at it. But I jump on it. I want it to be fixed. I want it to be addressed right away. The idea this morning is that most of us will rush to fix something that, that ails us physically. I wish that we could imagine for a moment that we could... Be sober to the reality that Satan, our adversary, is much like a virus. It, it knows our vulnerabilities and it knows where we are weakest and then he attacks. Imagine if we had a plan for handling a spiritual weakening like we do a physical weakening. Can I tell you this morning that a daily dose of scripture, prayer, and witnessing will help mightily in keeping one from the trappings of this world? Let me repeat that. A daily dose of scripture and prayer and witnessing. Witnessing. Yeah, the first two, y'all like those because we can all do those. Those are pretty easy. It's that third one, witnessing, that helps keep us from the trappings of this world. If you're not witnessing, you're already weak. I'll just tell you. That will weaken you faster than you can even imagine. But Paul did something in his final season of ministry to make sure that he and Timothy did not fall victim to spiritual weakening. But quickly, what is spiritual weakening? Well, it is a compromising of what God says so that we can do what we want. That's what spiritual weakening is. It's we compromise what God says so we can do what we want. So what does Paul do? He audits his peers. If you have a worship guide with you this morning, I want you to take it out and look at it. There are three categories that you'll see there on the front of it. I'll go through those quickly. The first one is those who used to be with us and are not with us. Those are the mission people. The second, those who are sent working and working sent for the Lord. And those who we need to partner with now. In your peer group, your Sunday school, youth group, preteen group, your ladies class, men's class, in your place of work, in your family, do you know who is who? With that simple piece of paper, you're going to begin this morning to work out, to audit, to figure out who the people are in your circle. In that top box, I want you to put five names. The middle box, four names. and the bottom box, three names. I would never ask you to do something that I myself would not first do. That's something that I've been taught by the men in my life, that they have done everything that they've ever asked me to do and probably more. I've already filled out all of my boxes with real names of real people that are really in my circle. Some of them I'm going to see today because some of them I happen to be in an in a, like athletic league with, and, and I'm going to see them this afternoon, and some of them I've committed in my heart that I'm going to minister to them today figure out which category that they're in and see if I can't win their soul before it's everlasting too late 
So make sure you're working out this piece of paper as I start to explain these different groups. The first one, those mission people or those mission again people. What does Paul say? He said that Demas is in love with his present world. Man, this world has some pretty things in it. This world has some shiny stuff. This world is coming for you and I. We're going to put the, a nail in this thing right here. How's that work? I'm not exactly Pentecostal, so y'all, I'm going to struggle with this, but we're going to get through. Paul says that Demas is in love with the, the present world, and he has deserted me, and he's gone to Thessalonica. So Demas, who was once called friend in Colossians and fellow worker in Philemon, is now called the mission again. We all know people who have set back and slid out. They are the mission again people. And we need to lovingly categorize them as such. Why do we do that? Why do we make sure that we have people in the right category? Is it just so that we can feel good about ourselves that I put somebody in a box? No. The reason that we put people in the right category is so that we minister to them again before it's everlasting too late. And so that when they get saved, when they come back to us, when they come back to the Lord, we can celebrate. This is what it says in Luke 15, 3 through 7. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. And then he calls all of his friends and his neighbors together and says, Hey, friends, neighbors, rejoice with me, for I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now you know why we focus on the gospel so much on a Sunday morning. We love to disciple you and we love to feed you sheep, but we also love to go after the one who's lost. Toss them over our shoulder and bring them back. If you're not careful, you and I sitting here every Sunday looking for somebody to quote-unquote feed us without us going out and doing all of the ministry God's called us to, we can slip just like Demas did. That is a warning to us today. I don't want you to become that mission again, people, and we need to know who the mission really is. The second group of people, those who are working sent for the Lord. Paul says that Crescens is in Galatia, and he's serving God there. Titus has gone to Dalmatia, serving the Lord there. Tychicus to Ephesus to serve God there. Who are your peers, and where are they serving God at? It never hurts to ask people in your community a simple question. Hey, where do you or y'all go to church? And if they say that they don't, then you get to put them probably in category one. That, that, that people that need to be ministered to right now. What me and, and some of the other ministers on staff here like to do, we like to ask people about their faith journey. Tell me about your faith journey. Tell me when you came to know Christ. And many people will open up and they'll share with us something. And from that we can kind of, we can synthesize and we can discern whether or not they've actually trusted Christ as Lord. And then we know how to go after them. But you've got to ask them. You sit around and your friends go by you this week and you haven't asked them, hey, where do you go to church? Hey, where are you serving the Lord? That is a litmus test of litmus tests. To ask somebody this question, hey, where do you serve the Lord at? And if they don't have a ministry, then know something about them, that they are in serious danger of spiritual weakening. And you can minister to them as such, if you're here this morning and you don't have any ministry that you're connected with, you're not doing anything for the Lord but coming to consume, know that you need to get involved in a ministry before you possibly weaken spiritually. Now Paul references a third group. He brings up this person, John Mark. He tells Timothy, I need you to go get John Mark. Another translation says, Bring with you John Mark. It's not if you can get him, but make sure that he comes to me. I need to see him at once. This last category is a graceful one. Those who you need to partner with now. We are told in Scripture that, that Paul and John Mark, they had a parting of ways. They had a theological 
uh, confrontation in which one went this way and one went that way. And, and we're needing to now bury that. Paul's saying, in my last bit of ministry, in my final season of ministry, I'm going to put aside those, those disagreements and I'm going to one more time unify around the gospel and try to reach as many people as I possibly can. So what do you and I need to do? We need to look around and see who we can partner with. If you are ministering, then you can minister alongside with somebody else. God doesn't call you to do this all isolated and by yourself. No, he calls you to get together and to, and to strategize, to work as one, to have a greater impact. And I know that you can, and I know that I want to. So on that piece of paper, who are you going to put in that, that box as someone that you can labor with again? Now we know that not everybody that we once ministered with are we going to get to minister with again. But we do know that there are some that we can and we should seek out the opportunity to do just that. Spiritual weakening happens, church, and guests alike, when we pretend that we've read the Bible enough not to need it anymore. Spiritual weakening happens when we say that we've prayed enough, that God knows our intentions and what we want, so we don't need to pray anymore. Spiritual weakening happens when we used to have a burden for somebody that we maybe kind of sort of reached out to once a few years ago but haven't since. We need to reach out to them again. So if you think that it's yes to all those, that I've, I've read enough, I've prayed enough, I've witnessed enough, the answer is no, no, and no. Here's what I found is a beautiful thing. When I think that I've read a passage of Scripture enough that it's, you know, I got it. God, look, thanks. You, you, you taught me what I need to know. And then the Lord just says, what about this? Now here, here's exactly what I need you to see from this passage for this moment. Or when I'm praying, and I say, I prayed about everything that I need to pray about, and then God put somebody else on my heart. Or maybe when I've, I've almost really, for all practical purposes, written somebody off because I haven't cared enough to minister to them again. And then I start to think about witnessing to them. I don't know, and you don't know, what God is doing in the background in their life to let the Holy Spirit work on them and you to bring them to a God moment. You don't know. But guess what I can tell you? It's not going to happen if you don't get in tune with the Lord. Somebody else will have to pick up the slack for you. And I don't want that to be the case. Now, the opposite of a spiritual weakening is a spiritual strengthening. And this action today will, will help you to do better this season in school, life, work, retirement, to fill it with ministry. And having a plan, let me tell you, it's paramount. A book I read many years ago by Mr. Collins, it said this, failing to plan is planning to fail. You may be here and you may, may be much like Demas and you used to love the Lord a lot more than you do now. Here's some good news. God still loves you just as much as he's ever loved you. But on our end, can't we devote ourselves to the Lord even more? Can't we come closer to him so that we feel his peace over everything in our life? You know, God's not going to give you peace if you're not doing his will. He has this way of causing you this unholy tension that disturbs you so deeply with his Holy Spirit. My prayer for you this morning is that you would see that God has something for you to do this very day. The gospel is good news. It's beautiful news. It's simple that Jesus came, was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, and then he went to the cross for your sins and mine. That if we would confess our sins, and we have them, y'all, if we would confess our sins to him, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and seal us for heaven. That's a beautiful thought this morning, to know that in this life I can minister freely, I can pray deeply for all of these people because I am sealed forever by the blood of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite quotes from one of the greatest preachers to ever live is a quote by Charles Spurgeon, and this is what it says. If sinners be damned to hell, at least let them leap into hell over our bodies. And if they are to perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. And if hell must be filled 
Let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions, not letting one go unwarned or unprayed for. Recently, I heard a pastor preach a message, and, and somebody recently shared it again, but it, it's so important not to, to, to bring it up again. It's this. If you had every prayer answered in your life this week, how many people would be saved? How many? Many of you would have won the lottery last week, huh? Yeah, that's great. Then you'd be more like Demas. You start buying all the things of the world, doing all the things of the world. But what if you prayed for your mom, who you know is still unsaved, your granddad, who you know is a tough old man, but you love him dearly? What if you prayed for your children that are falling out of church, your grandchildren that your kids aren't raising up in the church? What if you prayed for them to get saved? God answered all those prayers, and you saw something great happen. I, I can't tell you how many prayers have been prayed for little weight. All the prayers that have been prayed for him, they came to fruition in the last couple of weeks. And I pray that you'll be praying for people in a similar fashion. As we get ready to go into a time of invitation, I want to go back to Philip for just a second. Philip, not knowing that I needed to hear that prayer, not knowing that I was even in the room, not knowing even my name, did me a favor that I could never repay. The maintenance man, who was also an ordained minister, prayed a simple prayer from his heart of the life that he actually lived. And I've heard story after story about how he would witness to people that he comes in contact with, and he still does to this day. His prayer was, Lord, let us, not just other people, us. He included himself in that prayer. So I'm doing it with you this morning. Lord, let us, let our witness reach somebody else, our friend, our neighbor, a family member, a schoolmate, before it's everlasting too late. If you would bow your heads as we go into a time of invitation. Lord, we know one thing to be certain. Life is short and your grace is good. Lord, if we go into this next season of ministry and we don't give you our best, if we want to stay spiritually weak, it's going to be a rough road. But Lord, if we submit to you, someone here today who's never been saved. This message is not all of that charismatic. It's not all of that entertaining. There's no entertainment value in what's been said. It's just a plea from somebody else who's trusted the blood. Lord, I plead right now that they too would trust your blood this morning. Because that's the only
I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. 